Bishop Dr. Chantel Wright. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. To name a few of your accomplishments, you are an internationally celebrated choir director. You have been on the music staff of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, home of the late Dr. Martin Luther King. You've taught in the DeKalb County Public Schools in Georgia. You were the director of the Girls' Choir of Harlem. You established a nonprofit ensemble, Songs of Solomon, that seeks to empower, serve, uplift, educate, and inspire the world community, which has performed with Kelly Clarkson and Elton John. You inspire and empower music educators, such as myself, in the New York area uh, through the Carnegie Hall Music Education Workshops, and you teach at NYU. According to your bio, everything you do is because of your uncompromised passion to see humanity win. Do you think that humanity is losing? No. I don't think that humanity is, is losing. I think that humanity is in a testing ground where we're going to have to make some very serious decisions about our behavior and choices. I believe that humanity is winning because we just came out of a global pandemic and those who uh, made it out alive, they're still fighting every day to do it. Some are doing better than others, but I think that the human spirit, if it chooses to, wins. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we've got to make some serious choices, especially in this country. Darkness is all around us. And there are people who are determined to see demise and chaos and anger and bitterness and separation. So those of us who have light and have love, right, we have to stay engaged and we have to stay in the fight and fight the fight of faith, hope, and education. Oftentimes, uh, people are hopeless because they just don't know any better. Mm. And then those of us who have hope and light, even in our moments of discouragement, uh, still have something that the rest of the world needs. So is humanity losing? I don't think so. I just think we're at an inflection point where we have to make some very serious choices. Hmm. How do you think this recent global pandemic tested humanity? I had a conversation with a, a, one of my friends last night about this, and I'm not sure. Hmm. What I do know is we are not designed to be caged. Humanity, human spirits are not designed to be incarcerated or sequestered. Right. We thrive on connection. And so what the pandemic did was test our ability to withstand the lack of freedom. Mm. And some of us did it for the greater good and some of us chose not to. And so what the outcomes of that are going to be, I don't know. I do know that it was emotional. I do know that it was extremely spiritual for a lot of people. I do know that it was financial for those who gained and for those who lost. Mm. And so I know that we as a people globally are different. What the long-term outcomes of that, I'm not sure yet. Right. I'm not sure. Right. But we're changed. Yeah. We as 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 in as anyone would be able to say it, we are different. When you lock something up, it comes out different. Yeah. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. What do you think it means to be human? What is humanity? I think to be human is to see God in everybody. Hmm. Can I tell you a story? Of course, please okay. do. So in 2016, it was a Tuesday night. And I had my class at NYU, all, all girls. And so we went home and we were cheering for Hillary. 
And I got a call at two o'clock. I said, oh, no, somebody's died. As, <laughs> as, as a pastor, you know, you get a two o'clock call. You're getting up. You're getting dressed. And where do you report? Yeah. And the student manager of that class, she was crying. I said, what's wrong, baby? She said, Hillary lost. And I said, huh? It's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> she said, Hillary lost, professor. What are we going to do? I said, say a prayer. And when I'm clear in the morning, I'll call you. And so that day I had to be downtown. So I caught the train, which is something I don't normally do. I drive. So I'm on the train and I see the people cast down on the train, somber. Meeting was over. I came back uptown and got in my car. I'm driving down Central Park West. I pull up next to another car and it was a white man in the car and he had a large iced tea from Dunkin' Donut <laughs> and my windows were down because it was, it was still kind of warm outside. Yeah. He chucked the tea in my car at me and called me a nigga. And I said, hmm. Hmm. What are you going to do, woman? Is what I said to myself. Yeah. And all sorts of thoughts went through my head. Mm. And when I got home, I stilled myself. And in that moment, I made a choice that no matter what, because this has unleashed that. Mm. I have to be the polar opposite now and unleash love, unleash hope, unleash faith, choose to love those that I know hate me. Mm. Do you understand? Yep. And so opposed to being reactionary, I chose to be a human being. And I believe that this is where the next leg of ministry opened up for me. Right. In that moment, it was a paradigm shift. Right. Yeah, I didn't curse him out. I just looked and I said, wow. I didn't cry. I wasn't angry. But I knew that that, that things had changed forever in that right. one moment from, from, what is it, November 7th? Um, the elections are held I, I from, so, no, yeah. from, from November 7th, 2016 to November 8th, 2016. I knew that the life I would live in this country would be totally different. Mm. And I was the only one who had the choice of how that was going to fall out for me. It was a choice. Right. And I chose love right. and hence this journey. Right. Right. And that's humanity. Humanity is having the ability to strike out and hurt someone, but choose compassion. Right. Having the ability to like rumble in the street and choose nonviolence. Right. Humanity says, I am my brother's keeper. Whether you want to acknowledge that you're my brother or not, mm -hmm. my responsibility is to keep you. So that's, that's that, right. that's my little story. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I think the pandemic really tested and caged us as humans and really, I think, brought to light that we're not designed to be alone. Absolutely. But um, would you agree that up until the pandemic, I feel like we as a society have been less and less connected. And I think the pandemic was like the final straw. But, um, you know, just watching videos from, you know, the 20s, the 60s and 80s, you know, you see kids on the street, you see just communities spending time together. And I feel like the more we get technologically advanced, the, the more, you know, we move and march on with progress, I feel like we're also a lot less connected. I mean, you know, how many times do you see it in a street, even someone at a dinner and I don't know, they're on the phone or with the headphones. I don't know. I feel like pandemic was the absolute extreme of that, but I don't know, like, how did we get here? Do you feel like that the connection of what it means to be human has been slowly going downhill and the pandemic kind of really was like the straw that broke the camel's back or. 
Yeah, I can agree that it was the straw that broke the camel's back. I can I can agree with that. Um, Because when we look at it from an educational standpoint, some children did extremely well Mm. with online teaching. And some just capsized. Yeah. Right. And so when you talk about, you know, having to do things technologically, I believe that we missed the message in the like that social media provides. Mm. Just because someone likes something does not mean that they're connected to you. Just because you have, you know, I think I got like 5,000 fo- followers. Do, do 5,000 people call and check in on me? Mm. No. Only the ones that I nurture those relationships. And I believe that it now the requirement to reach out is even greater. The responsibility to reach out is even greater. So, so f- say for instance, you know, our choir had to shut down. Yeah. We couldn't sing. We could not, can you imagine not being able to sing? We couldn't sing. And so all of 21 and, and 20, nine, and whatever the pandemic years were when they just banned us from singing together in groups all together. And so, and coming back, and coming back, I went immediately to the community model, hmm. right? And so on Wednesdays when we have rehearsal now, I cook. Hmm. And we set the tables up and the phones go in a basket and you have to mix yourself, you get a number. You get a t- for, yeah. for how many tables there are, you get a, t- a table number. And you sit with those people at that table and you talk to them. <laughs> You have to talk to them. You're not on, we're not taking pictures. We are, we are having conversation. Mm. And I believe because we don't force ourselves to converse, we, we, it's compassion is really hard. Like in talking to you, you might bug out today. I wouldn't know that if I wouldn't, if I was not talking to you and I wouldn't be able to offer you that extra level of compassion. Right. And so, what was already headed toward uh, catastrophe. I believe that the pandemic finished it off, but I believe that we're in a great place now if we're willing to do things a little differently mm. to come out of it. Yeah, And that's, that's, that's an education, that's in business. Business is kind of leading the way. And even in the church, you know, everybody wants to run back into the sanctuary. That's not working either. Mm. Because people are not there. Our reach has to be farther than what we do on a Sunday morning with the same people that we see every week on Sunday mornings. Right. Right? Right. So the things we do now must be intentional. And not to move our tribalism further, but to move humanity forward. Right. What would some things be to move humanity forward? Like what were some things would you do differently um, just in general? Can you give us some examples? Um, I'm Okay, I'll use the church model for example. Because um, you know I'm a bishop outside of being music, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> we're out in the parks. I'm going into the parks. Mm. And I'm having worship services in the parks. We did it all last summer, and this uh, this coming Sunday, uh, which will I don't I don't want to date your 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 video here, but this is our first Sunday going out this summer. Mm. And last summer I wasn't really clear. This summer I'm very clear that it's about fire. It's mm. about lighting and igniting hope love and joy if you happen to come and join the church great that's wonderful that's icing on the cake but i see you in that corner of despair and so membership becomes secondary to resuscitation Mm. 
Mm. Restoration. Yes. Embrace. Loving kindness. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you join the club, that's cool later on. <laughs> but right now I see your need. Mm. And I believe if we can see the need of people, of our fellow brothers and sisters, opposed to, are you going to be on my team? Humanity stands a greater chance. Mm. I love that. Yeah. I, I, I don't necessarily need you on the team, but I need to know that you're okay. Yeah. And I can't be okay if you're not going to be okay. Mm. And that, I think, if we could start shifting toward that type of thinking opposed to the privilege of, well, everything is okay in my life. Mm. I got mine. You go get yours. Right. But somebody made a sacrifice for you to get yours. Right. So what relinquishes you from that responsibility of paying that forward? Mm. Wow. How did, did I get it? I, I, okay. I think you got it beautifully. Wow. <laughs> Um, how did you get involved in music? What is your journey to where you are today? My grandfather was an organist, mm. a church organist. And they put me in Miss Ida May's Sunbeam Choir. Sunbeam Choir. The Sunbeam Choir, honey. It was rocking Love and rolling. Three years old, and she stood me up and she said, Sing this to the light of mine. And I sang it, and that was it. So it went from Miss Ina May's Sunbeam Choir to Miss McDonald's Youth Choir. And then at my church, Mount Zion in Joliet, there was not a place for the young people to go. And so we lobbied our pastor and the deacons and the trustees, and they allowed us to build this choir, Zion Melody Choir. And we went from like 10 or 15 of us to hundreds. By the time I went to college, because wow. I went away, by the time I went to college, the entire choir loft was full that seated up to 150. And then we filled the front rows. And so that's the model that I used to build Songs of Solomon. Wow. It's just a duplication of what we built when I was in high school. Wow. And so music has just always been a part of what I am. And my dad told me that he named me Chantel because Kiki D played her as a singer in a movie in the 60s. <laughs> Go figure. Gotcha. Wow. So so you grew up in a church and you had family that were musicians and you mm -hmm. pretty much that that inspired you to continue that path. How did you make a choice to make it a profession? Do you consider, you know, being a singer and a choir director a profession? It used to be a profession. Okay. Now it's vocational for me. I feel like it's a calling. Mm. Um, and not just a performer, but a teacher. When I was, when I was doing my undergrad at Vandercook, I was so blessed. I was so blessed. Sterling Culp came and took me underneath his wing. And right before I graduated, I was bugging out. Like I was done with school. I, did, you know, that last yeah. stretch gets yeah. really tough. Yeah, it's, it burns out a lot of people. It burn, you know, like you get down to those last boards, and you're like, I'm not doing this. Mm. I don't know if this is worth it. And he called my mom to his house. He made us come to his house. Wow. And he sat my mother down, and he said to her, "She was born to teach. Mm. If we let her escape." the world is going to miss one of its greatest treasures. I'll never forget it. Wow. It was on a Tuesday night. And that's when I made up my mind to settle down and finish. And so music has always been a part, but marrying it to education, I realized that in my early 20s. Hmm. And so from, you know, it's because at Vandercook you had to do or orchestral music, you had to do symphonic band, and you had to do music, general music, all of it. It was the craziest yeah. thing. Yeah. You know a music yeah. education degree is nuts. And so in doing all of that, I landed in the choral and the orchestral conducting and started my career in music education. Always singing, but more so music education. Mm. 
Well, I mean, I can attest to that was your professor in college that yes. sat you down with your mother. I mean, yes. I can attest that uh, to that, that you are an incredible teacher. Thank you. Um, you know, I grew up in Russia. We moved here when I was a kid. But I think um, and, and, and that can be a very tough place where mm. you see a lot of uh, just just harsh realities as in many parts of the world. Um, but I think having worked with you, it was one of the first times someone taught me what humanity and kindness truly is. Yeah, so that was a very deep moment for me um, because I think it's something that you can't just read about. I think it's something you can't um, like just, I don't know, I think someone has to show, show you and um, lead by example. And I think um, you are an incredibly powerful educator. And that was a, a very, um, I, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, what you do and your spirit and your light, it's, I mean, it, I, it really, I feel like it changed me and how I outlook just on humanity. So um, I think your college professor was right. Wow. So, so thank, thank you, you, sweetheart. Yeah. I didn't know that. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think working with you at Carnegie uh, with other teachers, I think everyone that works with you, I'm sure feels um, somewhere on the same lines of, of why you have such a strong following. So, wow. yeah, so thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, it really is powerful. I don't think you realize, I think as most teachers don't, the impact that we have on those that we try to empower. So you never know it until somebody says it, mm. you know, yeah. that level of risk. Cause it's a risk to be that vulnerable, especially with educators, you know, cause their, their thought is got to get the program done. Mm. Tenors don't have their part. <laughs> the shoes didn't come in. <laughs> what color robes are we wearing? Right. And, you, you know, we're always wrapped up in those types of things. Right. And we forget that we are servant teachers. And so while we're serving our young people, mm. they're learning servitude. Right. While we are being vulnerable and exposing our life, lives experiences, it's allowing them to take that same level of risk. And so, especially when I'm teaching teachers, the one thing that they have to know is you can't teach something you don't love. Mm. And I'm not talking the love of the craft. I'm talking the love of the student. You're not going to like them all. Mm. <laughs> You're not going to like them all. Right. Some of them are going to rub you the wrong way. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's that's, that's, that's just right. what it is. And I mean, that's just how life is too, that's right? That's how it that's is. Just, just how it's it is everywhere. How it is. It's how it is. And it's normally the most challenging students that are there to test hmm. your humanity, hmm. our humanity. Right. Like, what are you going to do with Daquan, who is extremely talented but can't be quiet? You love him. You love him and you create opportunities for him to shine. And in and allowing him to find his greatness, your greatness is even more so exposed. Mm -hmm. It would be easy to relegate him as a troubled child. But love says you stand as much as an uh, you stand uh, uh, the the ability to have every opportunity that I've been afforded. And as an educator, my job is to carve out that path for you. Mm. It's it's easier to sit you down and try to make you be quiet. Right. But to find that path for you is where humanity is. Mm. And I love to start there with teachers, especially yeah. teachers who come from different places. Yeah. And thinking that our students are less privileged than us is, is always a crazy thing for me. Uh, then that means you're better than them. And right. who told you that? Right. No. Who, who told you that? Right. <laughs> Where you get that from? Yeah. That's not how that goes. Gotta keep putting that Bible. It's not in there. <laughs> it's, I, it, 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 no, 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 no. Yeah. You, you could be training the next Bach and not know it. Right. Right. Yeah. The next Duke Ellington. Right. The next Ella Fitzgerald the next yeah. Kathleen battle, you know, 
Right. You don't know that. Right. So we create those opportunities for them from the prism of love. Mm. And once you love your students and they know you love them, they'll do anything. Mm. They're just like an open spoon then. You're right. Here, baby, take some more of that. <laughs> and they eat it. They mm. eat it. So that's yeah. good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. What is the importance of music? Music is fuel for the soul. Mm. Yes. Yes. You hear a familiar melody and it immediately transports you to a place and a time. Music is, is life. A singer can calibrate atmosphere. Okay, so we're at church, right? Mm -hmm. And you go in and you're feeling down. And the soloist gets up and starts Amazing Grace. And immediately something begins to happen on the inside of you. That whatever it was you were experiencing when you got there, that sound has now penetrated that very experience and transported you to another place, a place of calm, a place of healing, a place of, oh, maybe it's not so bad. Mm. Yes? Yes. When you hear a full orchestra play in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and it opens up, and it transforms you. Mm. It takes you to another place. And as humans, we need that. Battles were won with choirs going forth and singing. <laughs> Can you imagine a choir mm. causing the trajectory of a war to move in a different way? We have to have it. Mm. It's a must. Yeah. It's a must. Mm. And and whatever we have to do to keep it moving is what we have to do. And our children need it. Our children need to hear pure sound, that everything doesn't go through a machine. Mm. Your voice is an instrument that is handcrafted by your creator. And right. your job is to unpack that. Mm. It's, it's that critical. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Yes. Talking to a musician. Yeah. Did I yes. get it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. What is community? You've mentioned community a number of times uh, already. What is community and how do you build community? Has it changed over time? Okay. Community is gathering. Mm. We try to make it something else, but it's gathering. It's people coming together. Commonality. Um, a, a community of singers, a community of athletes, a community of chefs, you know, it's people coming together and celebrating likenesses, differences, hopes, dreams, and goals, right? So I am now in this, you know, this is a new space for us. So I'm in a new community, mm. right? Um, and being the new kid on the block, well, what are you going to do here, Bishop? I said, well, talk to me. What do you need? Mm. And so when we, when we talk about community, community has to fill the need of those that are involved. Mm. And so, well, we want to do this and this and that and that. Okay, let's start with one thing. And then that builds a community based on what their need is, right? And so when you find communities that are not functioning properly, that's, that's a direct result of people's needs not being met. And when we think about the education system, we think about the justice systems, when we think about the, the, the religious or the faith uh, institutions, all of those things have to come together and figure out what the community needs. Hmm. And I think that post COVID, we were a little lazy with that. And so I'm encouraged to be here in this community to roll up my sleeves and get to work mm -hmm. because people need to know that there's a safe place for them to go and connect. And I think, you know, we're, we're in a great place now if we'll take it, mm -hmm. if we'll take it. Um, when we do, uh, when you think about 
building community, you know, one of the things that I think is important here is I'm going to start with the seniors. Because mm. that's grandma. Mm. Grandma has her finger on the pulse of at least two generations. Mm. She's got her kids and then she's got her grandkids. And so if grandma's needs are being met, then grandma can then inform the next generation and then that generation informs the next. But it's about what are the needs? Mm. And then you begin meeting those needs and people come together. Right. Yes. Right. And that's important now. Right. I think in COVID, we lost sight of taking care of the widows and the elders and the orphans. I think we lost sight of what do those two outlying groups need? Yes, we need what they have so that we're able to take care of the babies and the children. Mm. Community. Yeah. A place where people feel safe. What builds a strong community? What 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 makes a you know great, strong, successful, you name it. I mean, how do you build good communities? Leadership. Mm. By who? Compassionate leadership. Here's the funny thing. Whoever's going to lead, lead. Mm. Yeah. It could be a 19-year-old. They may have a great idea for their group of people, right? Who's, who's going to follow them? Those that, that, that know that their needs are going to be met. Uh, who, who are the leaders? We look to our politicians to do it all. We look to our pastors and our, our imams and our, 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 our priests to do it all. We look to, to teachers to do it all. We, we look to police officers to do it all. Doesn't work that way. Mm. We have to, we have to take agency. We have to buy in to what we want. It's not going to just fall out of the sky. Even with the choir. Okay, I said, you guys want a great choir? Then you have to be great first here. And then you go out and you teach other people and you show them, oh, I've got this thing going on here. I cannot be the only one responsible for recruitment. Mm -hmm. You're in a classroom eight periods a day with at least 30 kids. What are you talking to them about? Or are you only preoccupied with what's going on on your phone? Are you? If you think about uh, word of mouth is still the most powerful tool we have, mm. right? If you find, okay, so you wear your hair in a ponytail, you get a good haircut, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if someone asks, gives you a compliment, wow, your hair looks really nice today. What are you going to tell them? Oh, my barber or my stylist, such and such, cut my hair. Right. Right? And so members of your community now are connected to something that's going to make them beautiful. Mm. And so if we've got things going on in our community that are going to uplift you, right, wouldn't you go tell somebody about it? Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. That's how you build community. Right. It's still word of mouth. Mm. It is still uh, marketing 101. <laughs> If you want to call it that, right? Right. right? You got right. a good thing going. You have to tell somebody right. about it, right? And that's how it catches on. Mm. I feel like uh, members of communities can probably use a little bit more, I guess, agency. But I, I almost feel like I hear, uh, especially from from younger generations, almost this feeling of helplessness or like, oh, that's not. I can't make a change. I can't make a difference. I don't know, would you agree that there's a little bit more of that? Or has that always been the case where people don't feel like they have the power to make change? Why you ask me that question? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm because I'm facing it myself right now. I think, and I love millennials. Say Bishop loves millennials. Say it. She Bishop loves, loves millennials. 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 That's millennials. 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 She loves them. I think they got the most. Most what? They got the most. Most what? They got the most influence. They got the, they reap the benefits of a lot of struggle. Mm. 
they reap the benefits of modern technology. And I love those babies, I love them. But when you get so much and it came to you kind of easy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, just you have it. You just you didn't work it. for it. You didn't you, work for it. It's just like, poof, there it was. And it took a, a, an older member, a founder, to tell me. She said, Bishop, those kids re, re, are reaping the benefits of everything that we struggled in the streets. We had to catch the train. We had train passes and had to get to gigs on the train, wet in the rain. And this group gets to get on chartered buses and sprinters. We lived four and five deep in a hotel room and they get to sleep <laughs> one to a bed or a single room. And so um, what we have to do now is re-educate that generation to catch them on fire because they're still young enough that they can influence the ones that are coming. Mm -hmm. I am so excited about Gen Z and, and Generation X. Those babies have my attention. They have a reckless fearlessness mm -hmm. about them that as we channel that energy, they're gonna do great exploits. People are worried about climate control. People are worried about the future. When I see the tenacity of this younger generation, I'm not worried about it mm. because they're going to have to fight. Yeah, They're going to have to fight. If they don't fight, their children are not going to have a planet to live in. Right. And so it's just that middle group that makes the bishop a little nervous. <laughs> yeah. This, this, the new ones, um, we're gathering them now and we're teaching them civics. Yeah. We're showing them the importance of the vote. Yeah. Because if a small minority can make that much noise and get what they want, imagine what you would be able to do. Hmm. This is not a time to say you woke and be asleep. You have to be woke and woke at the same time. And that that is the generation I'm pouring into right now. Hmm. I, I have great confidence in them. Yeah. Yes, great confidence. These 20-year-olds, they're fiery. Yeah. With so much tension in our country, um, especially in our country, but also around the world, how do we heal and how do we move forward? I think the, the social media and the technology is bringing to light a lot of injustices and we don't have the time to unpack that. But how do we just move forward? I mean, it, it seems like when you turn on the news, there there is just so much pain and suffering and injustice and people not being able to talk to each other and move forward. I mean, from a politicians to the streets, right? As a country, how do we heal? How do we move forward? Like, just how do we do better? How do we survive? We're really going to go there. So let's go. How do we heal? We first have to acknowledge that we're broken. Mm. We have to acknowledge that it's broken. Right. If this mic didn't have a red light, you would begin to troubleshoot to see what you had to do to fix this particular microphone. Correct? Mm. Yeah. And what has been unleashed in this country is not something that's new. No. It's always been there, right? Yeah. But we have not had the courage to really take it on. Mm -hmm. You come from a different place, yeah. right? And so you're here and you see it. You can see, yeah. yeah, the injustice. You can see the inequity. It's rooted and it's deeply rooted in fear that somebody's going to get something that belongs to you. Mm. And until we begin to address that, right, right, that's number one. Number two, the minority is no longer the majority. The majority is rapidly becoming the minority and they're scared. Mm. And that fear is rooted in 
deeply rooted in, you know that you didn't do the right thing. And you're worried about what's going to happen to you because you didn't do the right thing. Back to my first point. Humanity says, I got to see God in you. Mm. In America, the black man was only considered to be two thirds human. Uh, for a long time. For a very long time. Whatsoever a man sows, he's going to reap it. Mm. And so you can't put seed in the ground of, of supremacy, bigotry, misogyny, xenophobia, uh, all of these different inequities, and think you're going to get an apple tree when it's all over. That's insanity to me. Mm. Yes? Yes? Yes. And so how do you heal? You say, you don't say stupidity like slaves benefited from slavery because when we came here, we were not slaves. We were enslaved. Mm. We came here as doctors, lawyers, tribal leaders, great mathematicians, and scientists, leaders of community. That's how we came here. Right. You enslaved us. Mm. And so the benefits that you think you gave us is oxymoronic because we had those when we came. We built the country for free. We multiplied mm -hmm. and gave you more free labor. And so at some point, there has to be a price for that. It's biblical. The children of, uh, of Israel were let go from Pharaoh's hand after plague, after plague, after plague, after right. plague, right. and they were freed. And they, they recouped what they lost during their time of enslavement. And so how do we heal and go forward? Banning books is not the way. Mm -mm. Abortion and reproductive rights are not the way. I don't believe in abortion, but who do you think you are to tell me what to do with my body? Yeah, agreed. Yes. Agreed, 100%. LGBTQ plus laws. Have you ever really sat down and talked to one of those brothers or sisters? Yes, that's not the way to do this. Mm. And so instead of us looking at each one of these things for what it absolutely is, we are now moving forward as cornered cats in fear. Fear only breeds more fear. Mm. I believe we heal when we acknowledge that all of these things are really bad and really wrong. And we simply say, I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? Right. To play the devil's advocate, people would say, well, those was, might have been sins of my father, right? I mean, how do we deal with past injustices and heal as, you know, current um, humans of this country, you know what I mean? So how we be human beings. That? We be yeah. human beings. Yeah. That's the cheap way out. Right. It's not my fault. Right. It's their fault. I, 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 I didn't do that. I, I, I'm not responsible. Right. We are responsible. We're totally responsible. Right. We're totally responsible. What's going on in, in, in the Ukraine and with Russia? He's responsible. Right. Full stop. Right. He's responsible. Trumpism is responsible for popping the zit again of the dark underbelly that lives in this country. And whether mm. it, wh whatever you think about it is your business. But the fact of the matter is if we don't acknowledge that this is a very serious problem, we'll never heal. Mm. And that's why in 2016, I chose love. Yeah. 
It is an individual choice, breast to breast. And only we know what's in our hearts. You can say whatever you want to say out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. What is in your heart? Right. What's in your heart? And you tear down racism one thread at a time. One thread. You, you, you tear down xenophobia one thread at a time. You come against Asian hate one thread at a time. Right. If you see a group of people and this is what they're saying, you don't go jump into the conversation and co-sign it. You check them mm. and we begin to heal. You don't, you don't combat homophobia and it, even in the church, even in the church, who am I? To judge you. Right. All I'm called to do is love you. That's God's job to do whatever he's going to do with the condition of your heart. Mm. And that's how we heal. And so I can sit in a room with, with transgendered. I can sit in a room with Asian. I can sit at the table with even white men. And be okay because I know that in my heart, my life's work is love. Mm. And I don't have to hide for that. Right. I don't have to apologize for it. No. I don't. I can show up in the totality of my humanity because I love you. I love you. Yeah. I love you. And I don't, I, I don't, I don't judge you. And, and as long as it takes for my light to shine in your life, because I believe that we, it's seasonal, we get seasons and places we get. As long as the season that we're here, my, the, the main reason I'm here is to love you. Mm. And when we get there, we heal. I could not make this statement to you if I had jumped out of my car November 8th, 2016. I can make this statement to you because I made a choice. And I encourage others to make that same choice. We have underestimated the power of love. Perfect love casts out fear. So mm. I don't have to worry about losing my station in life if my station is L-O-V-E. Hope. Joy. Peace. And that is as real as it gets. And our country is at a serious crossroads. I'm not looking at the dark side. I'm looking at the hope. I know that there are other people out there who are singing the same refrain. And I have to trust that as I'm singing it, someone else is singing it. And it's going into different corners that I might not be able to reach physically. That there is a hope that there is hope of healing. But we who believe and walk in the light have to stand up now. It's our turn. And we have to be unapologetic about our fearlessness to love those who don't look like us, to love those who don't worship like us, that don't sound like us, that don't have the same economic status as, as us because none of those things really matter when you're dealing with a human being. Hmm. Did I get it? <laughs> I think you got it. Can we lead by example right now? And if I can summarize just in a, a short um, statement, right? So... Mm. If I understood you correctly, right? It doesn't matter 
where you are, where you're from, if you say that this is your country, then you unequivocally, unapologetically take responsibility. Right? Full stop. Full stop. Say, if you say you're an American, if you're in this country and you choose to be here, that it doesn't matter what color you are, where you're from, whatever, right? You say, I am responsible. Absolutely. Right? right? You can't just take the good of what America is now without the bad in the past, right? So so then I guess in that- Because the past is supposed to educate us to be better in the future. Right, right. So then I guess how do how do we as a country heal is that we take responsibility for everything, right? Right. You have to take the country as a whole as you do, right, uh, in love and another human being, right? So then you take that responsibility. And I guess, do you then make informed choices about your influence, I guess, right? And um, and then you just choose to heal, right? I mean, then you... By an act of my will. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we as a country just have to make a choice to heal. And just whatever, you know, you have to take, right, everything as a whole and just do the best you can to make it better. And I think put the fear aside that if someone else wins, you don't lose, right? It's not a some all game, right? It's not, um, you know, life as in poker, right? It's not if if you win, then I lose, right? It's... You we have to, win. we all win, right? Either we all lose, right? Mm -hmm. Through that fear or we all win. And I think we have to make um, just that choice and responsibility, right? That whatever it is, you're responsible for yourself, for those, those around, around you, you, right? And you have to choose love and compassion and just to be when human. When we choose love and compassion, got it. Mm. Because no, you don't have to, because then that takes the choice out of it. Yeah. When we, when choose, we choose. When we choose. When we choose. And 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 we're winning when we choose that. Yeah. Can you share with us your experience at Ebenezer Baptist Church and what you've learned there? And it's the home of the great MLK, who's led so much change in this country. What did you take away from your experience there? And can you just share? with us, your time there? You know, <clears throat> when I was at Ebenezer, I was green. I had just gotten out of college. I had just started my career in teaching and they put me in charge of the youth. I had to build it, <laughs> right? Um, so that gave me the opportunity because it wasn't about the historic nature of the church for me then. Mm, okay. <laughs> was, you know, it was like, okay, this is what you've been called here to do. You have three children and three children does not make up a choir. Mm. And so they trusted me to build. And so I built, I built. And oddly enough, I went there to do the music, but that is where I found out the power of intercessory prayer. You know, I had always been around prayer all of my life, but no one had ever asked me to target a prayer for them. Mm. And so not only was it music that I learned there, but that opened up the gate for me to begin to pray for other people. Um, in a different kind of way. Um, and you think because it's historic and all of these other things are going on, what you learn is the struggle is new every day <laughs> for mm -hmm. whoever shows up to be in the struggle. Right. And so here's her famous father, right? But she had her own path to take and had her own people to influence and couldn't do it until she finished this thing. And so my time there showed me that the struggle never ends. Mm. If you're going to do it, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Mm. And the commitment cannot wane. I was around really great musicians 
Dr. Carter, Barrington Brooks, uh, David Murrow from Morehouse, they all came together all the time. So I not only saw great music, but I saw a community of really learned black musicians coming together to make sure that there was the highest standard of community and music mm. and prayer. People think it's just about Martin Luther King and it's a tourist site. It wasn't that for me. Mm. It was a place where people were very serious about what their calling was and how they were going to impact and affect change. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so when I left there, I was kind of ready to roll. I stayed there for seven years. Wow. Wow. What are some qualities that you try to encourage in humans and those you interact with? Um, what are some qualities as humans that we should all try to be like in a context of you know community that we make an impact no matter where we are, um, what what should we try to be? Authentic. Show up with your whole self. When you're doing the real work, the imposter can't show up. Mm. <laughs> the people please. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you authenticity when you show up in the totality of who you are it gives other people permission to do the same you can be a great leader and still have fallacies shortcomings mm. there might you might be a great orator but can't balance your checkbook <laughs> right so when i think about some of the greatest leaders that I have been around, they're just authentic. This is what it is. Yes, I do this thing really well. I'm not perfect. And because I show up in the wholeness of myself, other people feel at ease. Yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, to make mistakes. To be vulnerable. Yes. I'll, I'll cry on you in a minute if I'm moved. Mm. Yes. If I'm angry, I'm not afraid to show anger in a respectful way. It, I had to grow into that. Mm. And when it's real serious, I'm going to push you. I'm not going to push you from a place of lording over you, but I want to see what's in there. Right? Yeah. I want to see you take that risk. And, and people, people don't respond to phoniness. Yeah. It's like a pheromone. They can smell it. Yeah. Right? And so, and mainly, oftentimes, I am one of very few black people in the room. Mm. Can we talk about it? Let's talk. I don't have the luxury of presenting something that's just not what it is. Mm. If I'm going to be the change agent, I have to be there whole. Mm. And when people see me in places like the Metropolitan Opera or Carnegie Hall, I know quietly they wonder, how do I get there? How does she get here? Seriously? But, Oh, of course. Oof. Yeah, it's passive. We have a we have a meter for it. Black people have a little meter for it. Did you know that? No. <laughs> yes. Is there a name for that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Y'all call it a BS odometer. <laughs> 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 we call it spidey tendies. You, you, you know, we we can we sense it, right? Yeah. And so when I show up as my whole self, I don't have to apologize, or I don't have to be super great. Because I have to validate my place here. My authenticity allows me to sit at the table. Right. What is on the inside of me allows me to sit at the table. Yeah. And I, and I don't have to apologize for that. Right. Right. The journey that I have chosen to take allows me to sit at the table. Yeah. I have honed my craft and my skill that allows me to sit at the table. And so I don't apologize for that. 
And, and, and because of that, I am able to embrace all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, there was a time when I didn't feel this way. Mm. I had some prejudices that I that had to be worked out in me. Yeah. I'm being honest. Yeah. I had to work some stuff out yeah. to be here. Yeah. And God could not trust me at this place if he had not worked those things out in me. Right. And so when I say be integral, be completely integral. Be completely authentic. Mm. And those whose spirits are calibrated to hear your voice, those will be the ones that have been assigned to you. And we have to understand that we're not expected to change the whole world. There are certain people that have been assigned to come into our journey. Right. And if we take responsibility for our journey, those people will show up yeah. and we'll be able to do the work that we were created to do for those people. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that, um, and I guess this this goes back to just taking responsibility for the whole, as a country, one of my best friends is, um, he's born here, but he's of Peruvian background, so he's Latino. Okay. And we're having a, a conversation, and it really hit me when, you know, we just started talking about whatever, and then he said, every time I go into a store, he said, it doesn't matter that I might be the best saxophonist in the state. I get followed and I get looked a certain way mm -hmm. based just because of my skin color. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you mean, dude? I was like, are you serious? Like, and I, I think, you know, those kind of um, passive aggressive things, like, I, I mean, I've never experienced it. I mean, you know. I'm white as snow, you You're know. You're white as snow. Yeah, I'm white as snow, but <laughs> you know, I think I, I think that's that's part of the, I think reasons why you know some people have these luxury beliefs they don't think stuff is real is that they never experience it, and unless you have those conversations with those that are different, you just don't know. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, it never even crossed my mind to wonder if that is even a possibility. That like, why would someone do that? But that happens, and um. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I think for, um, you know, for for me, like, you know, I mean, I get pulled over and I, I, partly I think because I'm not from here originally, I'm like anything, sir, ma'am, I don't care what, you know, whatever you need just to go away. But that's not the case for someone that might look different than me. It's uh, much more um, dangerous. It could turn on a dime. Right. Uh, and it, it it's. It's very scary that it has nothing to do with who you are, what you've done, what you've accomplished, obstacles you've overcome, that it's as simple as just the way you look. Yeah, that's crazy. It's, the way it's, you it's, look. It's crazy. And, yeah. I, and, I, and, and that responsibility is a huge responsibility. Right. And so when I have opportunities to speak, I try to speak as clearly and as poignantly as I possibly can to educate. My experience is very different than yours. It's different. But if you take responsibility for my humanity the same way that I take responsibility for yours, we're going to be okay. Mm. Yeah, love that. We're going to be okay. Yeah. Right? And what I'm finding in this place, it's a much higher vibration. Mm. And so those types of people are now coming into my sphere. Mm. And I'm loving it. Yeah. But it was not, it wasn't something easy. Yeah. It was a, it was a fight and a choice. And so as we make choices to walk higher, shine brighter, live cleaner and more authentic, being fair-minded, being hopeful, hopeful. I believe that 
Everybody's scared about 2024. I'm not. I'm believing that there's enough people who are speaking this language yeah. that are going to begin to penetrate the earth realm and will be able to make better decisions for the greater good that love will prevail. I have to believe that. Yeah. And I choice. choose to yes. believe that. I was going to give my I line. choose <laughs> to believe that. Yeah. Yes. So in choosing to believe that, how can we be more connected and build better relationships with those around us and our communities? One of the problems, I think, is people don't get out much. Mm. Their vacations are like, I'm going to Disneyland. Well, why don't you go to like Dominican Republic or or go to one of the smaller islands? Get out of the norm mm. and see how other people live. Just take the risk mm. and see and, and broaden your scope. You know, one of the one of the demands that I make of the young people when they join Songs of Solomon, they, you got six months to get your passport. <laughs> Period. Because if we get take a trip and I need the whole group there and you don't have your passport because I don't, I don't plan on traveling outside, you will never know what is out in the world. Most of our lack of connectivity is because we just stay in our own little bubbles. Mm. How did you get here to America? What happened that brought you here? I know the interviewee is now interviewing yeah. the interviewer. Um, my mom's best friend emigrated here in 91 as a refugee. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that time, you can apply for others for the green card lottery. So mid-90s, she applied and we got it and sold everything and started anew and just moved and you know made a choice to have a shot at a better life. And... Um, I'm grateful, especially, you know, teaching and working with the young who haven't seen any world and they feel a privilege to these things they have here. Um, it's always a shock because I know the inequities of the world, right? And how different places can be. So we came in mid nineties and, um, you know, grateful to be here because I might be right now in a war zone and, you know, you could be in a war to, zone. Forced to do things I really do not want to do and be put in danger. That was not my choice. So um, very grateful to be here. And that's the, the short of it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. For a better life. Yeah. For a better yeah. life. And then our better life, right? We cultivate that. I really believe that charity starts at home and then spreads abroad. Mm. I wouldn't, you know, so I've done as much work here in this country yeah. as I have abroad um, for that reason. Mm. Would never want it to be said that I didn't sow into my own household first. Right. And then I'm over here in Spain. I'm over here in Italy. I'm over here doing this. So we take care of home first mm. and then we spread out. Yeah. But in that spreading out, it always energizes me to want to work harder when I get back. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the things I see, the places that I've been, like I've seen real poverty. Yeah. It's not this. Yeah. Poverty in America is one thing. Yeah. But poverty in South Africa is a totally different thing. Yeah. And one doesn't diminish the other. No. It's just, just a fact. It's just a fact. Poverty in Haiti is very different than poverty in the United States of America. Yeah. And so in making those choices, one of them has to be to get out and see how other people live. Mm. If you only have, if you're, cause I think we're so bubble oriented now. Yeah. All of the information that we consume comes from our own particular bubble. Yeah. And I believe that if we're going to have a larger community, we have to get outside of our bubbles. And take full responsibility for what we learn outside of that bubble mm -hmm. and then come back and teach somebody else so they can break somebody else out of the bubble. There's always that teaching element that has mm. to take place. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would your advice or words be to someone who's perhaps losing hope in humanity or feels very alone or very afraid? Um, what would you say to someone that's just you know, has nobody around such as yourself that is losing that hope. The truth be told, 
each one of us faces that every day. Mm. The truth be told, don't anybody fool you. Every day we make a choice to grab a hold of hope. As an individual, my faith in Jesus Christ has given me that hope. Mm. I have watched his hand in my life do things that I could not have ever done by myself. Mm. Made it through 9-11. And so when COVID hit, I knew that his hand was going to take care of me. Mm. And the world feels like it's exploding around me. And yet I feel this perfect peace on the inside. And so that love that died on the cross for me is present with me now. And so I don't offer you religion. I don't offer you, come and be a member of my club. I offer you the greatest love that I know. Mm. And it doesn't fail. When you're wrong, it corrects you. Mm. His love corrects you. Just correct it. Get up, baby. You did that wrong. Say you sorry and start all over again. That simple. Right. When you fall, you may fall seven times and you get back up. Yeah. That hope says no matter what's going on around you, I have a path that I have squared away for you that's going to keep you safe and protect it. Mm. And no harm is gonna come near you there. And the only thing that you have to do is trust and believe me, period. Mm. And, and, and there's gonna be some church people who may do all kind of crazy stuff. That can't be your concern. Your concern has to be my love for you. There will be some people in the world who will hate you because of the color of your skin. That cannot be the focus of your life. The focus has to be the love I gave for you. Right. There will be some inequitable situations that you'll find yourself in. Okay, that's all good. But it's my love that's going to sustain you. And if I can give that to anybody in this season, mm. here's a bucket full of it. Mm. Take it. Freely receive it. Yeah. And be safe. Any lasting <laughs> advice you have or just words of wisdom to anybody listening? Be encouraged. Mm. Be a state of being encouraged. Choose light. Choose it. No that when you make that choice, you are salt and light, and then other things around you will begin to shift. Be your most authentic self. Some people are gonna like your noise, and some are not, mm. and that's okay. That's okay, right. yes. And you gotta know that you were created for a purpose. And it wasn't just to sit and watch Netflix and be on Instagram <laughs> and Snapchat and Facebook. Mm. There's a power on the inside of you that will allow you to move mountains if you allow it, mm. if you choose it. You were not created for mediocrity. If you know that that light is on the inside of you and you know it, light people know it. They know it. They know when, they, when they're different. Oh, I'm... I'm I just don't fit in here. I just don't fit in there. That's a good indicator mm. that you're a change agent. Lead in love and light. And watch God do the rest. Mm. And show up, right? Show up. Show up. Take responsibility. Right. Make no excuses and take no prisoners. And do your absolute best in everything that you do. Right. It pays. Yeah. And love everybody. Yeah. Love everybody. Right. Love them. Yeah. Love them. You, you fall out with them. Don't let the sun set. Go and fix it. 
Yeah. And if they won't talk to you today, fi- try to fix it again right. tomorrow. Right. But let love always, peace always, right. hope always yeah. and be, be your o- guidepost. And, and be okay with uh, nobody's perfect, right? If you're here on this planet, right? I think the other thing is we're so afraid to make mistakes and mess up. I mean. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. I'm a mess. <laughs> I'm are, here to tell you. Are we all? <laughs> And the older I get, I forget things, mm. you know, all of that. But it does not change our purpose. Mm. The next big thing could be in your belly. The next big idea that's going to catapult humanity, you could be the carrier of it. Mm. Take responsibility for that. Yeah. Say your yay and let it be yay. Don't compromise. Mm. There's enough of that foolishness out in the earth realm. I'm into that. Be whole and complete and be all right with being whole and complete and do what you were created to do. That's my advice. And I love Jesus with my whole heart, Mm. with my whole heart. And he allows me to love even my enemies. Yeah, Bishop. Yeah, thank you so much for... (laughs) taking the time to to do this um anybody listening um to just share any light with us and for being you and inspiring and leading those around you thank you very welcome thank you <laughs>